Many are pondering this question, especially considering what happened. Last April, French President Emmanuel Macron stirred controversy by cautioning Europe against getting involved in a conflict between the United States and China over Taiwan. He emphasized that being allies with the United States didn't require being its vassals. These remarks reignited discussions about France's push for strategic autonomy for Europe, aiming for independence from the United States in strategic matters. This notion unsettles Central and Eastern European countries, which rely on the United States as their primary security provider in potential conflicts with Russia. This divide raises the question, does the EU require its own security and common defense policy? Or should it explore closer collaboration with NATO? In today's video, we'll dive into these challenges. Stay till the end to know about Europe's new compass and what it has to do with NATO. The historical ties between the EU and NATO have seen a nuanced evolution, deeply linked with the geopolitical shifts of post-World War II Europe. Established in 1949 as a bulwark against Soviet aggression, NATO's primary objective was collective defense. Similarly, the EU's precursor, the European Coal and Steel Company emerged in 1951 with a focus on economic cooperation to prevent future conflicts. Over time, both organizations recognized the symbiotic relationship between security and prosperity in Europe, especially in post-Soviet Union Europe. With the rise of Putin, especially in the late 1990s and early 2000s, there was a realization that NATO and EU must collaborate to resolve Europe's problems and make sure Russia does not become assertive. Two elements are to be taken into consideration when looking at the establishment of the European Union. NATO relations. First, as soon as the EU started to express the will to play a role in security and defense matters, the question was posed of its relationship with NATO as the main defense actor in Europe. This was a time when, in the United States for example, questions were posed about what the EU would bring that NATO doesn't already do. Second, from the very beginning, the European security and defense policy of the EU was conceptualized with NATO crisis management operations as a template. To a large degree, the EU wanted to replicate what NATO was doing at the time in Bosnia-Herzegovina. Thus, from the beginning, the EU-NATO relationship was both about complementarity slash cooperation and competition in the crisis management market. Insofar as the treaties are concerned, things were quite clear in terms of the division of tasks between NATO as a collective defense actor and the EU developing a security agenda short of collective defense. For example, the EU's Maastricht Treaty was making clear that the policy of the Union in the defense domain shall respect the obligations of certain member states under the North Atlantic Treaty and be compatible with the common security and defense policy established within that framework. In other words, the EU could only develop an agenda that would be compatible with what NATO already does. Yet in practice, the line theoretically distinguishing the two organizations' respective agendas has been difficult to identify, and the EU's will to play a role in defense has been a source of tensions with NATO. If you like what you see, do subscribe to the channel and like the video. Before diving into the disagreements and challenges, it's important to highlight the opportunities within the NATO-EU relationship. For instance, the interaction between the EU and NATO is influenced by the fact that most EU member states rely on NATO for their defense. 23 out of the 32 NATO allies, with Sweden soon joining, are also EU member states, and for many of them, NATO remains their primary defense guarantor. This has become particularly evident since the Russia-Ukraine war. Consequently, these countries' perceptions of the roles of both organizations are shaped by this reliance on NATO. For countries feeling threatened by Russia, especially Poland and the Baltic states, NATO remains the dominant European defense actor, meaning the EU's role in defense is secondary. This is partly why the concept of European strategic autonomy wasn't well received in these countries. They felt it excluded NATO and the US too much. And there were differing views on the EU's strategic autonomy. While France strongly advocated for this autonomy, other countries had different perspectives. For example, Italy, Spain, and Greece focused more on Mediterranean security challenges such as illegal migration, maritime piracy, and terrorism. They prioritized building capabilities in these areas rather than striving for full autonomy. Meanwhile, Austria, Ireland, and Sweden maintained neutral policies and preferred non-military solutions to international conflicts. Thus, challenges persist, affecting the roles of NATO and the EU in politics. Another challenge in European common defense has been budgetary issues. European defense spending has increased by 4% over the past decade, 
and is projected to grow by more than 6% annually in the next five years, according to McKinsey. However, many NATO countries still fall short of the alliance's guideline that members should spend at least 2% of gross domestic product on defense. And if you remember, this discrepancy in defense spending has been a point of contention between Trump, NATO, and Europe. Moreover, for example, Poland has increased its defense budget to 4% of GDP, while the EU has launched a joint procurement scheme to boost 155 millimeter shell production for Ukraine, spurred by Estonia. Despite some countries like Italy and Germany expressing intentions to increase defense spending, actual progress has been limited. Under such circumstances, NATO takes the forefront in providing security rather than the EU. However, the EU has taken steps to become more autonomous in its defense in recent years, especially seeing the US take more interest in the Indo-Pacific. For instance, see this. The EU launched a strategic compass in 2022 that talked about making the EU a stronger and more capable security provider. It was built on four key pillars, act, secure, invest, and partner. And that's a long-term plan beyond 2025 and 2030. To ensure a rapid and robust response to crises, the EU plans to establish a strong rapid deployment capacity of up to 5,000 troops, deploy 200 fully equipped mission experts within 30 days, conduct regular live exercises, and enhance military mobility. Additionally, it aims to reinforce civilian and military missions and operations, utilize the European Peace Facility, and promote financial solidarity. In terms of security, the EU aims to strengthen its intelligence analysis capacities, develop response teams for hybrid threats, establish a cyber defense policy, address foreign information manipulation, implement a space strategy, and bolster maritime security efforts. Member states committed to increasing defense expenditures to bridge capability gaps and enhance the European defense technological and industrial base. This involves exchanging national objectives, incentivizing collaborative capability development, and boosting defense technological innovation. To address common threats, the EU plans to strengthen cooperation with strategic partners like NATO, the UN, and regional partners, while developing tailored partnerships with countries like the US, Canada, Norway, and the UK. Plus, it seeks to enhance dialogue and cooperation in various regions worldwide and support capacity building efforts. And if you see this last part, partner, this shows that NATO and EU can collaborate. In facing modern challenges, it's clear that modern solutions are necessary. One key lesson learned from the Ukrainian conflict is the critical importance of being prepared for cyber attacks. Following the invasion of Crimea in 2014, Ukraine experienced what is regarded as the first successful cyber attack of its power grid, highlighting vulnerabilities in critical infrastructure. Although network activity recovered swiftly, the incident raised concerns within both the Ukrainian cyber defense system and across Europe. In 2022, as tanks advanced into Ukrainian territory, Satellite communications became the target, an area not adequately covered by existing European cybersecurity legislation, yet crucial in contemporary conflicts. The proposed approach of the Strategic Compass aims to enhance existing tools, like the Cyber Diplomacy Toolbox, while introducing new measures to address hybrid threats. And the Compass, as we earlier mentioned, also outlines plans for the establishment of an EU cyber defense policy. So because of this very reason and other emerging challenges from Europe, both NATO and the EU need to ensure avenues for collaboration. While Macron might be hesitant, perhaps due to internal politics in France, for a stronger Europe to address increasingly complex security challenges, cooperation between the two is essential. Failure to do so would result in more problems for the world, particularly Europe. So what are your thoughts on this? Let me know in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel, like the video, and watch our video on whether the West truly wants to dominate Eastern Europe.